Hi, I'm Daniel Zengel with Regenitech, joined once again by Don Lipscomb. And we are going to be discussing platelet-rich plasma injections for hip osteoarthritis. Uh, so hip osteoarthritis, also known as hip OA, is one of the most common forms of osteoarthritis. Mm -hmm. It actually affects about 27 million adult Americans, which is close to about one in 10 people. Um, and you probably know someone with hip osteoarthritis if you don't have it yourself. Uh, definitely more common in the older population. And um, one of the, the things about hip osteoarthritis is it, it greatly affects people's quality of life, right? So this is caused by a, a wearing down of the cartilage in the hip joint, and it can make it painful for people to walk, to sit, to lay. It can cause a lot of problems. So what happens is a lot of these patients who have severe and chronic hip osteoarthritis will end up getting total hip replacement surgery, uh, which although it's a relatively safe surgery, um, is generally something most people are gonna wanna avoid at all costs. So the common sort of medical approach, one of, one of the most common approaches to help prevent surgery in, in hip osteoarthritis patients is hyaluronic acid injections, uh, also known as HA injections. And um, these tend to work, at least temporarily. Uh, there is the, definitely some clinical evidence to support the use of hyaluronic acid injections. Uh, what we're gonna be talking about today is, is how PRP injections might be a more favorable alternative. Uh, but first, Dom, could you explain for everyone a bit about hyaluronic acid injections, what they are, how they can help with hip osteoarthritis? Yes, absolutely. Um, so osteoarthritis is a slow, painful process caused by degeneration of cartilage and overgrowth of connective tissue and bone. Um, so inflammatory signaling molecules interfere with the body's ability to produce hyaluronic acid, which is a glucosamine, and that gives syn synovial fluid, which bathes the joints, um, it's lubricating qualities, and this is called viscoelasticity, which basically means that it's something that can um, sort of expand, but then also retain its shape. So it, it has sort of that, that like gelatinous, spongy quality Got to it. it. And I hear you correctly, you said when there, when there is inflammation in the joint, this prevents the production of hyaluronic so acid? So it's not necessarily inflammation, it's just inflammatory signaling molecules, okay. which, which are signaling molecules that um, can, can promote inflammation, but that's not exclusively sure. all that they do. Okay. Um, so this loss of lubrication is what causes the degeneration of the cartilage and it stresses the joints. Um, so like you said, a common treatment is to inject with hyaluronic acid into the joint to restore the lubrication that's lost right. based off of this chronic progressive loss of the body's ability to produce its own hyaluronic acid. Okay. Um, however, it's only a temporary solution and patients normally have to return for further treatments. Right. Um, so in previous studies, PRP or platelet-rich plasma has been shown to reduce pain and enhance function in right. knee osteoarthritis. Right. Um, so PRP is derived from the patient's own blood mm -hmm. uh, by separating out the different components of blood and concentrating the platelets and growth factors to much higher levels than what's found normally circulating right. in the body. Um, so PRP is thought to restore normal joint properties by promoting growth of the extracellular matrix, uh -huh. which sort of uh, think of it as a scaffolding for the joint, and also restoring hyaluronic acid production. Okay. Um, and also modulating inflammation and angiogenesis, which is this um, the overgrowth of blood vessels, um, which is thought to actually cause a lot of the chronic pain because the blood vessels, sort of like an ingrown nail, right. they'll grow um, in and uh, stimulate nerves all the time. Oh, okay. And so this is thought to contribute to the chronic pain. Got it. So it sounds like the PRP helps on multiple levels mm -hmm. with uh, this vasculature issue, this overgrowth of vasculature yes. that can occur in hip OA patients. And then also the interesting thing that you point out is hip osteoarthritis is often marked by the, the patient's inability to produce significant or natural or ideal levels of hyaluronic acid. Mm -hmm. And so the, the traditional approach is just give them more hyaluronic acid, right? Inject that into them. 
Whereas with the PRP injections, it's actually helping their body produce more hyaluronic acid. So that to me sounds like a more long-term solution. Yes, exactly. Because um, the PRP uh, has growth factors that promote new cell regeneration. And these cells are the cells that actually produce the hyaluronic acid. Right. Um, so today we're comparing uh, two different studies that actually examine the effectiveness of PRP over hyaluronic acid treatments in, in osteoarthritis of the hip, mm -hmm. uh, which hasn't been done before, like I said, uh, before knee osteoarthritis was examined. Right. Um, so the first study consisted of 11 patients divided into three groups. Okay. Uh, these, two gr these three groups received injections of only PRP in the hip, mm -hmm. Um, PRP and hyaluronic acid, right. or just hyaluronic acid alone. Right. Um, each group received three injections, mm -hmm. um, one week apart, and they were evaluated and showed that the PRP group actually maintained mobility and pain improvement longer than the PRP and hyaluronic acid group, or just the hyaluronic acid group alone. Okay, interesting. So I could understand why we might see statistically mm -hmm. significant improvements in the PRP versus the hyaluronic acid group, because as we just discussed, the PRP mm -hmm. pr provides more of a long-term uh, solution, which is really the hallmark of regenerative medicine. But I'm, I'm curious, do you have any theory or hypothesis why the PRP did better than the PRP plus hyaluronic acid group? Well, it could have just been uh, the different concentration of platelets and growth factors that were actually supplied. So the PRP plus hyaluronic acid, it would have been half PRP, half hyaluronic acid oh, versus 100% PRP. They so then you the end up with volume of PRP for this? Uh, no, no. Oh, so the injection volumes were all the same. Oh, yeah. that's kind of an interesting way to do the study. Well, I, I actually think that that's a, a pretty good way of, of, you know, testing if just a little bit of PRP right. might be enough to push it over right. the edge. Um, so the second study actually had a very different outcome. Uh, so the second study had 80 patients divided into two groups who received injections of PRP or hyaluronic okay. acid. They didn't test the third category. Mm -hmm. um, and they, uh, they had a similar treatment regimen. It was three injections, one week apart. Okay. And um, after 12 month evaluation, just like the previous study, um, they showed no statistically significant improvement actually between the two groups. Oh, wow. So you might wonder why this disparity. I have some ideas, but what, what are your thoughts? Um, so the first study actually acknowledges that the patients and physicians had knowledge um, about who was receiving PRP versus PRP and hyaluronic oh, okay. acid. So it was not uh, double-blinded. No. Um, not so even blinded at all. No. So this okay. knowledge may have introduced bias in data interpretation sure. and or the placebo effect. However, the, the people that um, actually received the data and evaluated it, actually, they did not know. Oh, okay. Who. Okay. It was just the physicians sure, and the sure. patients. Okay. Um, the groups also, though normalized for age, were not normalized for sex. Mm. So there were actually significantly more men in each group. Than, we're still talking about the first study. Yeah, the, the first successful study. study which which seemed, may have affected the outcome. Sure, and it's a pretty small sample size to begin with. Yeah. Right. Um, the second study, however, uh, though it was double blind and normalized for sex, did not investigate the contents of the patient's growth factors. Okay. Um, so this could lead to different formulations of PRP injections sure. and could have subsequently caused the different results. Right. Uh, overall, uh, I think a gold standard, which a lot of other authors and physicians and patients mm -hmm. are kind of insisting to establish, um, you know, for, for future studies. Right. And, and I agree. This is something that's such an important topic with PRP, with stem cell therapy, with, with these new forms of uh, cutting edge medicine that are that yeah. are coming into play right now there's always going to be a huge disparity um, between different companies that produce the the products for this right so when they when they make PRP a lot of times these these research studies are using equipment that is produced by a company specifically to make yeah. PRP right so each company has their own design of how the tubes are made they have their own protocols for how long you centrifuge the PRP or what type of anticoagulant you use, how much of it you use. So it's really just a different formula for each company. And that's somewhat unavoidable, right? Because once you make your design for your PRP kits, 
you're gonna copyright it and trademark it and and it's it's not like someone else can just copy your design and do the exact exactly. same thing right so so that's why it's important in these studies that they do what you're talking about which is actually do lab analysis of the PRP serum to determine what growth factors are present and to determine the concentration of platelets. So, mm -hmm. so really, they should be doing a lab analysis of the patient's blood and then also a lab analysis exactly. of the PRP serum that they produce so they can compare the concentration relative to their baseline. And it sounds like they didn't do this they in the second study. They did not do this in the second study. And I think going back to the first study, uh, the, the group uh, with, that had PRP and hyaluronic acid didn't really show a statistically significant improvement. Right. And that could have been because they had less PRP right. versus By the original group. By definition, the so, concentration would have been cut in half. Exactly. And so um, patients in the second study may have easily had widely varying mm -hmm. amounts of growth factors and platelet counts. Yeah. Or I think they, they did do platelet counts. It just wasn't growth factors. Okay. Or growth factors. Um, in, in the final solution that was right. injected into their bodies. Right, yeah, and, and there are studies that have been done, these independent sort of third-party analysis of the different PRP products, the different kits on the market, and you'll see the, the concentrations and growth factors and platelets span the whole gamut. I mean, you could mm -hmm. have th some of the most effective kits are achieving concentrations of close to seven or eight percent, which we've seen in other studies that have been successful, and the other side of that and that's seven or eight percent, I'm sorry, seven or eight times platelet yeah. concentration is what I'm referring to. Uh, and then on the other side of the spectrum, you'll see PRP kits where literally the end product has a lower platelet concentration than the patient's blood. That's not going to be very effective. No, no, it's it's detriment. It's 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 doing worse than if you just put their blood back or in. Or a them, saline probably. solution. Yeah, or maybe, <laughs> maybe so. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of the, what we're looking at. Um, so, so in the second study, the results were it was just no no the, results, no basically. statistical difference. Yeah. yeah. Although, although it should be noted that the PRP group did not have worse outcome okay. than the hyaluronic acid group. So it, it was, was just, not statistically it, worse. Yes, okay. it was not statistically yeah. worse or better. Just yeah. no results. So yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. I mean, again, I, I know I probably sound like quite the optimist trying to defend <laughs> PRP, and uh, it, there must be some reason why it didn't work, but. <laughs> Uh, also, it's, it's important that we consider these studies that show uh, maybe PRP is not a, as effective for certain conditions. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah, so thank you, Don. Thank um, you. Yeah, we'll, we'll have some more videos coming up in just a minute uh, about platelet-rich plasma.